one second. Of course, that'll allow people to come in. I see more people are coming in. Welcome, everybody. Give me one moment. Welcome, everybody who's coming in. Just going to get this up and running on YouTube as well. All right. And we have Helen and uh, two, we have two Dans now, Ivan, Joseph, Leonard, Helen, Lewis, Sharon. Welcome everybody. <clears throat> okay, so tonight we are going to, um, and for people who are just coming in, usually I, you can see my room, but I, I did, I'm trying one of these backgrounds uh, and that's South Beach, which is very close to where I live, so. Tonight, uh, we'll be talking about sugar, and we're gonna be speaking about why it's so bad, uh, what makes it addictive, and then we'll go through the difference between glucose and fructose, and we'll also talk briefly at the very end about what are the 56 names of sugar, because a lot of times sugar is hidden in foods, and as a result of that, um, we end up consuming more sugar than we want to, and if you get an idea of the different names, then you're really prepared to be able to reduce and eliminate the, these types of things that are sort of hidden because what we're what you'll learn is that the food companies uh, really do some tricky things. Mostly the bigger companies do tri trickier things. Like as an example, you can use various names of sugar, different types of sugar. And while it looks like maybe there isn't that much in there, when you add them up, it could be a little bit more. Thankfully, the FDA now has something on there for new labels that says added sugar. And that's a very good thing for people to, to have. Uh, as always, um, I often recommend various different resources for learning more about this sort of topic. What I, who I learned the most from when it comes to really understanding sugar is a doctor by the name of Robert Lustig, L-U-S-T-I-G. He is, a, I think he's head of the Department of Endocrinology at UCSF in San Francisco, very good medical school and medical center. And he's written many books on sugar and has sort of popularized the concept in the sense that he's, he's made it very easy to, I think very, made it very easy to understand. And just my own understanding has been improved so much by listening to videos by him. We have a bunch of other people who came in. Hello, Vicky, Valerie, Sheila, Sharon, Linda. Uh, welcome everybody uh, and welcome to the class. So let me uh, share my screen and we'll get started. Hope um, everyone is doing well. Let's uh, give me one second here where I share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right, let me blow this up a little bit. And let me know if you're having any problems seeing my screen. Um, and if you have any questions, as always, uh, just type them into the chat box. And we really, I love having questions. So please let me know if you have any questions as, as we go about it. So I am uh, entitling this, The Truth About Sugar. And I believe actually one of Robert Lustig's books is um, The Bitter Truth About Sugar or something like that. And as I said, we're going to go through essentially what happens with consumption, why it's so difficult to stop. We'll go through glucose, fructose, and then the 56 names of sugar. Having an understanding of the difference between glucose and fructose is really going to make a huge, huge difference. Uh, uh, you're welcome, Caroline. Caroline's uh, uh, saying she's excited for the session. Well, I'm excited too, Carolyn. So thank you for, for being here. All right, so let's go through uh, the first part of our lecture. Let me move things around here a little bit. All right, let's get started. So let me close a few of these windows. So why do we consume it when we know that it's so bad? Well, essentially, uh, you know, it's the same reason we still, people still smoke, they still take drugs. Part of it is an addiction. And we'll get into a little bit of the, of the understanding of really what that actually means using a word that's so strong like addictive. It makes me think when I hear that word, 
it almost sounds ridiculous. It's like, come on. I mean, it's not cocaine. It's not crack. It's sugar. I mean, how could it possibly be addictive? And in because we have this kind of conception of what addiction is. So I hope by the end of this lecture that you have an understanding of a little bit more about about addiction, opioid receptors, that sort of thing. Now, opioid receptors uh, are in your brain that make you feel pleasure. One of the one of the ways that that food can make you feel pleasure. And it just so happens that there are four um, types of foods that also activate opioid receptors. We'll get into that in just a moment. Um, we also know that it tastes good. Sugar and sweet makes things taste good. So that's another reason why, um, obviously it's not the only biological reason. The difference is often that you don't know you're eating it because a lot of times it's hidden in processed foods. So some of these opioid receptors, which make you feel good, are being activated and you don't actually have like a conscious understanding or feeling about what's happening. It's something that is, is happening, but you can't really describe what it is. And so that's why a lot of people have a difficulty in, the, in understanding the difference between you know, an addiction like cocaine and an addiction like sugar. Obviously, there are two very different things, and you have to look at it in a very sort of different way. Um, it's in all kinds of packaged foods. It's, it's in bread, it's in uh, sauces, salad dressings, tomato sauce, you name it. It's packed into so many different things. And so you have to have a, a pretty good understanding of what the 56 names of sugar is. But as I said, nowadays, it's, it's great that the FDA has acknowledged and made it law that for, mo for companies, they need to put added sugar so that all those get, get combined. So the question is, is if we're consuming it and we know it's bad, is it a lack of willpower? Well, the numbers are not really clear, but um, Dr. Lustig likes to, likes to say that, you know, some people have a susceptibility to alcoholism, a certain percentage of the population, some people don't. And so what's probably happening with sugar is something very similar there's probably a small percentage of the population, or maybe even, you know, I don't think they've, essentially they haven't done the numbers to be able to say what, what that is, but there's a certain percentage of the population that probably has this susceptibility, this, this susceptibility to becoming addicted to sugar, even though there's no sort of conscious acknowledgement of that. And what's happening is essentially you're getting some activation of opioid receptors. Now, um, other foods that activate opioid receptors. So wheat, and it's specifically the gliadin particle, which is a part of the gluten. Now there's been uh, um, a lot of people who are saying that, well, gluten is essentially not changing in wheat. And there actually have been studies to show that the percentage of gluten in foods actually hasn't gone up. But what has gone up is the component gliadin. And gliadin is what makes modern wheat somewhat problematic. It's not, the, it's not necessarily the gluten, although gliadin is obviously is part of gluten. So um, I must say that uh, the last couple of weeks, I've never actually gone on Twitter before. In the last couple of weeks, I've gone on Twitter and it's really terrible <laughs> on Twitter with people arguing and fighting. I never realized actually how toxic Twitter, Twitter is. Uh, I, I started to follow several health influencers and I always read various different groups. You know, I have, I read people who are eating carnivore and I follow people and read journals from vegans and the whole, I try to keep myself well informed about what people are saying. One side who is basically one person was actually more than one person was saying that, you know, the fact is, is that gluten hasn't increased. And that's true. Gluten in the, you know, you hear a lot of people complaining about wheat, but the truth is, is that uh, gluten has not increased, but gliadin has. And gliadin is what increases your appetite and it binds opioid, opiate, opiate receptors. In fact, there've been studies to show that there's a drug called naloxone, which actually blocks the opioid receptors. It's actually given to people who have like an opioid 
uh, overdose, you know, because it blocks the receptors so that the, so that if you were taking, say, you know, heroin, uh, if you took, if you gave the person naloxone, they wouldn't get high if the naloxone's in their system because it's blocking the receptors. Remarkably, that when you give someone uh, naloxone, famous study, they actually reduced their intake of calories by 30, something like one third or 30, something like a third, 30%, something like that. Um, and people, it stimulates appetite. So while most opioid receptors, when they're activated, cause you to feel pleasure, in this case, gliadin causes you to increase your appetite. So people tend to eat 440 more calories per day. A dairy is also another one of those things that is very, very difficult for people to get rid of. It's because it has something called beta casomorphone. And this is, see, this looks a little bit like morphine, this casomorphone, and it actually is. It actually activates your opioid receptors. And dairy tends to be one of the most difficult things to get rid of for people. I know that in my medical practice, getting having people uh, get rid of dairy is remarkably difficult. Now, there's a whole host of reasons why going on a dairy-free diet might be that uh, a problem, um, but that, that we should talk about in another, another lecture. Oddly enough, spinach and soy both have some, but obviously they're not very strong because I don't know many people who are allergic, who are uh, addicted to, to spinach. Uh, maybe Popeye, I guess it was addicted, <laughs> was addicted to spinach, but, um, and then soy also has, but again, it's probably not a very strong effect. Uh, Dan is asking, does this mean that we should eat as little wheat and dairy as possible or avoid it altogether? It really depends on the situation. There's no question that a little bit of wheat uh, is probably not going to be a problem. So, and people have been eating, you know, there are ways of getting uh, ancestral wheat. You know, they have these non-modern, I forget what they call them. Uh, they call them, um, has a name uh, where they talk about uh, like heirloom varieties or, or something like that. I think it's like heirloom varieties of wheat that basically they have a gluten, uh, assuming you don't have a gluten issue, then you're not gonna have to worry about this appetite thing if it's a, if it's a um, if it's this heirloom uh, variety that hasn't, because wheat's been sort of crossbred and that's what's it, that's caused this gliadin to increase. And then also there's fat, sugar, and salt. And this is something that the big food companies, they have essentially been um, manipulating in many different ways. And there was a great book that I read many years ago called Salt, Sugar, and Fat by Michael Moss. I know my, my father and I both read this book and uh, had, had some discussions about it. Essentially, they do things like they manipulate the fat in a way so that it gives you this mouthfeel that is pleasurable and activates some of the pleasure centers in the brain. And they also have what they call a flavor burst, which is where they powder, you know, seasonings like salt with other types of uh, natural or artificial uh, flavorings. And it'll, it, you know, it's like when you eat a potato chip and you get that powder of flavor and it makes your mouth start salivating like mine is now. I'm just thinking about it. That's how they've sort of hijacked our, our system. Uh, that's not something that occurs naturally in nature. And so that's one of those things that is something that's a modern way of getting you sort of addicted to food. Okay, but I don't wanna to get too far off um, from sugar. So let's move on to, now so let's talk about a table sugar. Table sugar is sucrose. And sucrose is a combination of glucose and fructose. Now I don't wanna get too complicated here or confusing, but let's think about it this way. Um, let's, let's put sucrose aside <clears throat> and let's talk about glucose because glucose is essentially what your body runs on. Your body is prefers to run on glucose, and that's your blood sugar. So when you go in and you get your blood 
sugar checked, they're measuring the amount of glucose in your system. So it's essentially safe in the sense that it's the energy of life. It is what runs through your bloodstream and powers your cells to be able to generate energy. So it's necessary for life, but it's not necessary for consumption. It's not one of those things that you need to eat because you get it from food. Now, starch, as an example, is uh, sort of like when you eat a potato or a sweet potato, starch is essentially, a, a when you think about it, it's like um, a chain made up of links and each link is a glucose molecule. And so when you eat starch, it digests, and then you have these enzymes and these enzymes come in and they're like, they come in and they snip, they're almost like scissors. And they snip these chains so that you're left with links, just the links and the link itself is glucose. So that's what is essentially powering your, your body. Now as an additive, it's really not that sweet. It's not nearly as sweet as fructose. Um, and it also does not stimulate the reward center of your brain. So it's not going to be something that is going to be addictive. Now you can get, a, you, you can add glucose syrup to foods, which would make it more, somewhat more safe than, than fructose, which we'll be spending the most of our time talking about. There's a product called Caro syrup, which is just glucose. Uh, the Japanese have this thing called koji chocolate, which is basically koji, which is a fungus that lives on rice, can basically break down the starch in rice. And when it breaks down the starch in rice, it's left, you're left with glucose and they make it into a bar and there's no chocolate in it, but it, it tastes sweet and it's pure, uh, pure glucose. Um, diabetics sometimes carry around glucose tab tablets and, um, the, again, they're not, they don't, if, you, if you've ever tasted a glucose tablet for someone who's diabetic, they don't really taste that great. It's not like something that you would want as candy. So it's not very appealing as a sweetener. Now molasses, which is pretty nutrient dense, um, is roughly 50% sucrose. So now sucrose, as I said, is, it's half fructose, half glucose. Um, and then it's 25% glucose. So, so molasses has a great deal of glucose in it, which would make it relatively safer. And so you could make a cookie, let's say with molasses, but I don't think it would be as, as sweet as you would get from, from just sucrose, table sugar. So it's just not that popular as a sweetener. Now, glucose syrup is used. Sometimes you see it in some confectionery products, but usually it's also used, there's also other types of sugar that are in some of those products as well. So glucose is essentially what's running around in your bloodstream now. If your blood glucose goes too low, you die. If it goes you know, too, too high, you, you can die. It's you need glucose, you need the right amount of glucose. And remember, sucrose is half, is, is like one glucose particle attached to one fructose particle. All right, now let's go into fructose. And this is where we're gonna spend, believe it or not, the next 20, 25 minutes, because it's so very important to understanding why sugar is so, so dangerous. Um, and, it's important to understand this. I mean, once you really start, once you understand fructose and why it's so dangerous, um, then, then you'll, you'll have a better understanding of it. But let's start with what about fruit? Well, fruit has fructose in it, but the, the point is, is that the fiber in fruit makes it less dangerous. And the same with the phytonutrients. Believe it or not, there was actually a study done that showed that, um, that even the, the phytonutrients, like the pigments and things like that in, in say blueberries and such are going to affect the, the, the rapidity of blood sugar that in your bloodstream. So fruit is less dangerous than just added fructose. Um, so that's, what I, that's one of the first questions I always get. Now, obviously it is very possible, especially if you have metabolic 
damage, which you'll understand once we go through these other things here, may be worthwhile, may be worthwhile to reduce the amount of fruit. It's certainly good to know which fruits have very, very high amounts of fructose or high amounts of sugar in general versus those that don't, like a handful of berries loaded with fiber and not all that much sugar in them. Tropical fruits like pineapple and mango and papaya, they're so amazingly delicious, they, but they don't have as much fiber and you're getting a large amount of fructose. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have pineapple. You know, there's benefits, other benefits to pineapple. I want everyone to understand it's not, you need to look at things from a whole lot of different perspectives in the sense that, you know, obviously fruits and vegetables are going to be very important for your overall health. The point is, is as I said just a second ago, if you're having metabolic damage, and we'll define what that actually means in just a moment, it's worthwhile first shifting to low sugar fruits, handful of berries, as an example, um, as a first step. And then if, not, if you're still having issues with what potentially could be some fructose issues in, with your metabolism, then it's reasonable to try to reduce them even more and focus on, on vegetables instead. But that's an individual decision that you should work with with your doctor. So fructose, it's much, much sweeter. So that's why, as an example, you have fruit, high fructose corn syrup. Um, these are great to, to sweeten all kinds of different things. Uh, it's important to note there's no dietary process in the human body that requires fructose. Now, we spoke about glucose at length, and we understand now clearly that glucose is what runs our body. It's what powers a lot of the chemical reactions, you could say, that occur in the body that allow you to function. And obviously, you know, people are very much into the keto diet, but even when you're on the keto diet and your body is using fatty acids to, as an alternative power source, your blood glucose is, is still staying in a safe level. It might be lower than, it, than if you had a piece of chocolate cake. But even when you're in ketosis, your blood glucose needs to stay at a certain amount to maintain life. And in fact, uh, when I was at, uh, I was at a, a metabolic, what's called the Metabolic Health Summit, and I had a chance to talk to um, a doctor by the name of, oh, my memory is not serving me well tonight, but uh, it'll come to me in just a moment, who wrote a book on I can picture his face, but anyway, he's an expert in treating cancer, certain cancers with a ketogenic diet. And he was saying that certain cancers, you know, thrive on sugar. And when you are switching from the ketogenic diet to when you're switching from um, burning sugar, glucose, to burning fat, ketogenic diet, for those cancers, they become more responsive to treatment. But the problem And he basically said to me, you know, if we could get the glucose down, you know, more and have more and, and really just deal with, um, deal with the fatty acids, you we would have much better effect. So they're working on things to modify this sort of natural limitation because your body needs to keep your glucose at a certain level. So getting back to this, it stimulates the reward center of the brain and that does not happen, as we mentioned, with glucose. There is no reward center of the brain that is activated when you're having glucose. Uh, so that can lead to addiction, which we spoke about a little bit earlier, which does not, again, happen with glucose. So let's get into the toxic, what's happening um, and, make, and what makes fructose so toxic. Let me just blow this up a little bit. Okay, so essentially, uh, there are other, there are many toxic effects. Uh, the main tox direct toxic effects are the liver basically turns fructose into liver fat, triglycerides, and that causes fatty liver, which we've all sort of heard about in the news. 
And let's talk a little bit about, actually, let's talk about a little bit about fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, prior to 1980, it was a result of alcohol. It was called the alcohol, um, fatty, um, alcohol related uh, fatty liver disease. Uh, nowadays, 10% of children, 25% of adults have fatty liver disease. And I, I think all doctors see this. I've, I saw, I had a kid just a couple years ago, I remember, it was just one of those, I, I, at the time I wasn't actually aware of how many children had this. And I saw this kid who had really bad fungal infection covering his um, feet and his, both his toenails and his fingers. And he really needed to be on an oral antifungal. But unfortunately, his liver enzymes were elevated such that uh, I couldn't give that to him. And we had to try to treat it topically. And I couldn't get his, uh, his gastroenterologist was, didn't want me to give the oral medications either. So we tried to treat him. And I, I remember, you know, he was, he was like 12, but he weighed probably 200 pounds. Um, and I remember speaking to his mother and this is just an aside. And I, I, I asked her, you know, I can't, I told her I can't give him the pills to get rid of this horrific fungal infection. And and, you know, I spoke to uh, his pediatrician and I asked the pediatrician, you know, could I, could I talk to the mother about, about diet? And he said, you can try. I've already asked. I've already talked to her. I spoke to her and she basically, I said, you know, I, I, I explained the situation and, I, and she basically just said, I'm not going to change his diet. He likes to eat what he likes to eat. And I don't want to deprive him of that. And I, I couldn't, you know, it was one of my, this was one of my first it was a very, it was very sad and very frustrating. And, um, but the fact is, is that 10% of children now, um, and actually Dr. Lustig, um, when he, I've heard many, many interviews, he actually says something like 25% of children and 40% of adults, but the numbers that I looked up, um, were 10% of children, 25% adult. And that's by, that's more than enough. Uh, because when we realize that five to 12% of patients progress to cirrhosis of their livers, then really, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a major, major health crisis, uh, some of which is, is fueled by, by fructose consumption, especially uh, sodas. So let's go through what are, what are the causes of these fatty liver disease? They're generally, there are other causes but the main four are fructose, which obviously we spoke about, alcohol, which prior to 1980 was was the most uh, was was the was almost exclusively alcohol. Now we have other issues, uh, branch chain amino acids that are found in corn-fed beef. Uh, essentially, this uh, es excess branch chain amino acids turn into liver fat, and liver fat, of course, impairs insulin signaling, uh, driving. Uh, metabolic syndrome and inhibiting leptin, which is the satiety hormone. And we'll go through these a little bit more in detail. Uh, trans fats also can cause this. So trans fats are things that are what are like called hydrogenated fats, and they're often added to cakes and, you know, to make them more shelf stable. And they're remarkably deadly. Uh, in fact, it's I, there are certain cities that have banned trans fats and that's how deadly they are. I mean, you only need like four or five grams of this to increase your risk for heart disease by some crazy number. Just you really just only need a little bit per day. So it's very, very toxic. And in general, I'm actually not against banning foods. You know, in, in general, I think if people you know, generally people know what junk food is, and I'm, I'm definitely not in favor of, you know, banning soft drinks and, and such. But when it comes to trans fats, which are really fake fats, lab generated, generally speaking, um, I, I can almost, even though I'm 
sort of ideologically against, you know, uh, banning foods and such with trans fats, it's, it almost makes sense in that, in that regard. Uh, it is just so deadly. So you really need to look for hydrogenated fats in your food. The reason I'm making these asides is because I, you really need to have a general understanding of how all these things interact with each other. Um, and that's why some of these asides I think are actually very important because when you learn things in isolation and you don't see how they connect to different things, that's when you get really confused. But if you can get an overall feeling of things and understanding of things and how, how one or two things may interact, then you remember it easier and it just tends to make a lot more sense. At least I hope that's what you're finding. Now, the next is glycation. And well, glycation is basically browning of like when you brown your food or uh, like you toast your bread, this is called the, the Mallard reaction. And the Mallard reaction is basically sugar binding to, pro to protein. And that's called glycation. So it's why you put barbecue sauce on your, your meat when then you, it, it's essentially you're, you're adding sugar, which is then binding to protein and that's glycation. So uh, one, one article described it as glycation of proteins interferes with their normal function, which basically means proteins are this, it, proteins in general are these long folded, you know, they're very, very complicated when you look at them. And if you have sugar, specifically fructose that is binding, because mostly fructose we're talking about here, binding to proteins, that's interfering with their shape. And if their shape is off, then they can't do what they're supposed to do. And so that's what's basically happening. Now you can get glycation with glucose, uh, but fructose is eight to 10 times more powerful than glucose when it comes to, to glycation. So if you have glycation, then um, if you have glycation, then if you have fructose, then you're going to glycate a whole lot more. Dan is asking, so we shouldn't be eating toast. Well, there's uh, what are called like advanced glycation end products, which is what we're talking about. Um, there are external like uh, AGEs and there are internal AGEs. An external AGE would be like toasted, anything toasted. And that carries its own that carries its own issues and is not safe overall. You, that's why it's important to, to be aware of these things because they actually, the acronym AGE, Advanced Glycation End Products, is very, very accurate in the sense that it actually does cause aging. So brown foods in general should be minimized in your diet. So, the, so I'm not gonna say you can't eat toast every once in a while, but, um, you should be aware that you're, you're ingesting what are called advanced glycation end products. The most troublesome of these is when you're basically cooking meats and you're, you're I know it tastes great to have charbroiled meat, but in addition to the glycation that's happening, there's some other things going on there that are dangerous. That's why everyone should learn how to braise and pressure cook and uh, boil or cook in sauce or whatever the case may be, learn a few of these for, if you're going to be eating meat, learn how to cook it without, without actually you know, browning it in the sense of, on, so if you cook it in water as an example, like in a pressure, in a pressure cooker, like an instant pot, you're going to reduce the amount of that is going to be on the meat. So, and the reason is, is as we spoke about, the, this glycation is interfering with, with the shape and the function. And we wanna be supple, we, <laughs> we wanna be supple. Supple, spelling mistake there. Flexible, and glycation does the opposite, it makes you stiff. So it's one of those things that is responsible for stiffness of the arteries, which is going to lead to increased uh, heart disease. Uh, stiffness of, of your tendons and in your skin, 
when you glycate the collagen in your skin, you get wrinkles. And the reason you get wrinkles is because essentially when the, when the sugar binds to the collagen, which is a type of protein, it changes the actual type of collagen, changes the shape of that collagen into a different type of collagen, which is different and yields, it's not as strong and it leads to wrinkling. This is what causes you to age. Obviously sun does the same thing, except it sun ages you by shriveling up, essentially damaging the collagen and getting and reducing the amount of collagen. If you're eating a lot of sugar, especially fructose, then you're going to be binding a whole of the sugar into your collagen and it's going to make you age quicker. And I can tell you uh, now that I've been seeing patients for 20 years and my, my initial postgraduate training for medical schools in dermatology, and I still see, I still see dermatology patients. Uh, of course, I also do um, you know, lifestyle medicine for other things, but I still see dermatology patients. And I can tell you after 20 years of, of doing this, you can tell uh, between diet and sun exposure, who, who has, you can see the, the increase in wrinkles, people who have, you know, um, who are consuming a lot of sugar. And quite frankly, I can see it in some of my, of my friends, uh, several of whom have, you know, chocolate addictions, so to speak, and, uh, or consume a great deal of sugar and they look older. I mean, that's just, just the way it is. And all of these chronic the chronic damage of of this glycation is really what we see in people who have diabetes that's what makes diabetes dangerous because their blood sugar is continuously elevated now it might not always be fructose but as we spoke about even though glucose is elevated there's still going to be some glycation, and that's what causes cataracts and retinopathy and neuropathy, nephropathy of the kidneys, cardiomyopathy, all of these diabetic complications, the majority of them are the main, one of the main contributing factors is this binding of sugar to protein. And that's the glycation. Glycation in the brain predisposes to Alzheimer's disease, and that's why it's also been referred to as type three diabetes. And uh, even my father years and years ago, probably 20 years ago, had this notion that, uh, my father's also a doctor, had this notion that he thought that Alzheimer's had something to do with, with blood sugar. And you get glycation in the brain and that, can, um, that contributes to, to Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Let's keep on moving. Let me do a time check here. Wow, time is flying. Okay, so we spoke about fruit. Uh, now we're gonna briefly talk about mitochondrial dysfunction. And I know all this sounds scientific, but just bear with me and you'll understand these very, very shortly. So the mitochondria are you know, commonly known as the uh, powerhouse of the cell. And actually mitochondria exist in the cell like another cell. In fact, we get them from our mothers and they are, you know, in evolutionary history, mitochondria are thought to be essentially cell, you know, cells that took on another cell inside to, to do some of the work. And that's why you, you don't form mitochondria, you get mitochondria from your mother. And so you can do genetic tests on the mitochondria to to learn about sort of the lineage of, of your mother. Now, all of the things, mitochondrial dysfunction sort of underlies a lot of what's going on here. Uh, it underlies some of the problems with glycation, as we spoke about how it's deforming the proteins so they're not able to do what they are supposed to do. Um, oxidative stress. So with oxidative stress, you know, your body essentially releases um, peroxide in your, in your cells and to kill things. I mean, this is a natural process. And so if you don't, if you're not able to reverse that, you get a great deal of oxidative stress. That's also happening. Um, insulin resistance, again, your ability to process, to use insulin. I mean, once insulin starts to rise over, over the years, your, your cells are like, I don't really want any more of this because there's too much of it. And so you start to develop uh, insulin resistance. 
my membrane instability. So this is where your cells, as we spoke about, they, they're meant to be, the cell membranes are meant to be supple. They're meant to move and be flexible. When there's membrane instability as a result of this uh, glyca uh, mitochondrial dysfunction and such that can happen from fructose, which is essentially um, affecting the way the mitochondria function, you're gonna get some membrane instability. And then the cell can actually break. Um, then methylation. Methylation is where you get a certain, you're, it's essentially signaling your DNA to do something. And if you can't methylate properly, there's a whole host of problems that can happen. It basically means that when your body needs to express a certain gene or a certain function through genetics, it can be, there can be a problem if methylation is a problem. Um, autophagy, many of you probably know about autophagy from some of my other lectures. It's usually, it's sort of like the, uh, it's sort of like remove, it's taking out the trash essentially. It's taking out the old parts of the cell. So we all have these old parts of our cells and there is recycling that goes on. Now, fasting is one of those things that, uh, especially long-term fasts, after, after around three days, there's something called the fasting mimicking diet, which many of you who will come on to my class weekly know that we've spoken about, which is a fasting with food thing where you can actually reduce the number of calories and still get the benefits of fasting. Day three, four, and five, you get an enormous amount of, of autophagy. But there's a, a low level of autophagy that happens all the time as just regular upkeep, and that is also inhibited. So you're basically building up it's like, um, as uh, one doctor, uh, I think it was Dr. Lustig described, when autophagy is shut down, it's like the, it's like the um, garbage men have gone on strike and the, the, the trash is starting to build up. So all of the above used to be thought of as diseases of aging. In fact, you know, up until 15, 20 years ago, glycation, oxidative stress, insulin resistance, all these things were basically considered just things that happen as you got older. And now we know that uh, it's a little bit more, it's definitely more complicated than that. And there are things that you can do to get rid of all these. And obviously, what, is, what would that be? Well, today, of course, we're speaking about getting rid of, of added sugars and fructose in your diet as the primary thing that we're talking about here. Now, of course, in other lectures, we've spoken about other things as well. Now let's talk a little bit about the effect of fructose on the immune system. And it can really be divided into uh, direct and indirect. So we'll start, with, uh, we'll start with direct. Now, there is something called lipopolysaccharide. And this is what's called, it's, it's basically what's called an endotoxemia. It's where you basically get uh, it's basically, think of it this way, it's an inflammatory marker that you're getting from your intestine into your blood. And it's, it's not good for you when that happens. And LPS, lipopolysaccharides, can be found in the blood after a sugar-heavy meal. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, what, what it points to is that something's going on with your intestinal permeability. Now, there is one cell that basically one layer of cells that protects you from, from the food in your gut. If you think about that, and they're little, and they, they're, they're next to each other, and there's a protein in the middle called zonulin, and in between these two cells, the, the zonulin this, this, uh, that's inside, it, between these two cells regulates what gets through. And what's thought, it's, I don't think it's been proven yet, but that fructose depletes the energy in the intestinal cells, which means that they, they can't do what they're supposed to do. They, they can't decide, oh, I'm gonna let this guy in or not let this guy in. They, let every, they tend to let everyone in. And intestinal, increased intestine, intestinal permeability has been implicated in a whole host of problems, including autoimmune disease, uh, strongly, strongly implicated in autoimmune disease, but also affecting so many other organs in, in your so many other disease processes in your body. When you, um, zinc, which we all know now is very important for your gut, your immune system, 
when you're eating a lot of sugar, you basically deplete the zinc in your system. And the zinc, I think, I don't know the percent, but something like 20 or 30% of the population is already zinc deficient, uh, which is mainly because of um, depleted soils. But uh, again, there's mineral deficiencies are, are a significant problem, but you don't wanna make your zinc deficiency any worse by, by eating a whole lot of sugar. And then of course there's indirect. So indirectly speaking, you have high insulin levels. And when you have high insulin levels, um, as an example, this is just to talk about COVID, the, the portal into cells is called the ACE2 inhibitor. <clears throat> and ACE2 inhibitor essentially is how COVID gets, gets into your cells. And then it's a virus, so then it goes to your DNA and basically this is hijacks a cell. And insulin regulates these receptors. So if you have high insulin levels, you're essentially going to get more COVID, more of an increased risk of getting COVID into your cells. And essentially there are three populations, unfortunately, that have been shown to have um, problems with COVID more than the rest of the population. Uh, African -American, Americans, unfortunately, um, because there's been estimated that six, they eat 60% more sugar on average than the rest of the population. They also are known to have very high insulin levels. And you know, when I've spoken about insulin levels in the past, uh, one of the lectures we spoke about that in was blood tests that should be part of everyone. Everyone should know what their insulin level is because it's a very good indicator of a whole host of things. You can go back to my lecture on that. But we, when you have very high insulin levels, just as an example, one of the things that happens is that your body is not able to liberate fat, get rid of fat, because it's going to inhibit an enzyme that breaks down fat. So when your insulin levels are high, which are caused by high levels of sugar, but also high levels of animal protein, um, you're going to have a difficulty in losing weight. And unfortunately, because of these naturally high insulin levels and 60% more sugar on average, African-Americans have a staggering 50% chance of having diabetes in their lifetime. That is horrible. It's very, very sad. Um, the next thing is obese. Obesity is going to, because of this insulin issue, is also going to, uh, again, it's going to regulate this ACE2 receptor and, and have issues. And then of course, preexisting uh, conditions as well. So I hope you're starting to understand all of the various things that I could probably, uh, we spoke a little bit about just about every organ that in the body, we spoke about the, the problems that diabetics have with glycation. That's the main issue happening in organs throughout their, their entire body. We've spoken about skin and aging. All of these things are causing you to age. They're causing you to age, not just from, a, you know, not just externally, but internally, something to really be to really be focused on. Um, okay, before we end tonight, I just wanted to go into the fact that I'm happy that the government has, has now put a law for added sugar. However, I think the company has to be a certain size in order to change, in order to change the label. I mean, eventually they're all gonna have to change it, but I, usually what's the first, um, the first uh, step essentially is, is, is for that. So, um, okay, now next, uh, 56 names for sugar. Let me blow this up a little bit. Okay. So here are some of the names for sugar and then I'll answer some questions and we'll say goodnight. Look at all these. So obviously some of these are, have more glucose than fructose. The point is, is to be aware of added sugars in, in your diet. There's one called, uh, that I actually don't see on here, called sucanet, which is, so, um, which is made from cane juice, but has a little bit higher percentage of glucose in it. it I've, it's not, not, our, not extensively, um, extensively processed, so. 
Uh, Dan is asking, uh, we are told to eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. How do we balance the fruit part when too much sugar is bad for us? Well, uh, generally speaking, fruits, two, two things to be aware of. One is fruits generally because of the fiber are not problematic because they're, they're slowing the absorption of the, of the fructose and the phytonutrients that are in there are, are not going to be all that, they're going to help with, with the issue. But again, as I, as I briefly mentioned before, you should be aware of which ones are high sugar and which ones are not. So berries generally are much better. They're much higher in, in fiber than some other fruits and they are lower in sugar. So blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, whereas tropical fruits, generally speaking, are, um, are higher in sugar. So how do you balance that? It really depends on what your goals for health are. It depends on what your average blood sugar count is. It depends how much white flour you're eating. You know, all these things that, that also cause, cause your blood sugar to go up. Pat's asking what's considered to be a good insulin number. It depends on who you talk to, but you want it as low as possible. I have patients who have three, four. Uh, you certainly want it, you know, under 10 for sure. But uh, some anti-aging experts uh, recommend under, under seven or seven or eight. Uh, you want it pretty low. It's not particularly uncommon for people to have very, very high numbers. Um, and they might be listed in the normal range, uh, but really because that's, because normal ranges are based on averages, uh, you can't necessarily go on that. So you want it in the single digits essentially. So uh, next question is very poor people add Lewis is asking, very poor people add caro to evaporated milk as, as uh, infant formula. Um, okay, yeah, I, did, I didn't know that. And caro syrup, as, as we've spoken about, is uh, pure glucose. And that actually tends to, tends to make sense. So, uh, Vicky is asking, what about erythritol and other sugar alcohols? So that's probably worth another lecture. Uh, I didn't want to actually go into that, although I can certainly understand why, why uh, you would ask that question. Erythritol is synthesized, but is also found naturally. And um, some artificial sweeteners, most of the artificial sweeteners like asp aspartamine and and um, uh, sucralose, spartamine and sucralose particularly are very damaging for um, damaging for the gut microbiome, which you spoke a little bit about that intestinal permeability issue that is also related to the gut microbiome. So, um, so it's hard, it's, which, Dan is asking which sweetener is deemed least offensive. Artificial sweeteners, I mean, I, I don't recommend artificial sweeteners for another reason, which is they change your palate so that you need sweeter and sweeter. And you wanna really cultivate palate sensitivity, something I've spoken about before, but actually not in a long time. When you're consuming sw artificial sweeteners like stevia or which is natural, any of these sort of non-caloric sweeteners, I should say, some of them are so sweet that your ability to perceive and to really appreciate fruit, natural berries and such can be damaged by, re it's almost like a thermostat. It's setting your thermostat higher. Pat is, uh, oh, thank you, Pat. It's reminding me that, uh, the, so the doctor I spoke to at the Metabolic Health Summit, who we were talking about the ketogenic diet and, and how, uh, how blood glucose is, his name is Thomas Seafried. Uh, S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> uh, Sheila's asking, um, can you have frozen non-sugar yogurt during the summer? So the, you know, there are a lot of these yogurt places uh, here in Florida where, uh, and I'll just, uh, sorry, let me just um, stop sharing my screen here. Um, and it really depends on what the sweetener that they use is. If it's sucralose, some of them use sucralose. Uh, I'm not a, and that's probably not a good idea to, to have sucralose. 
but you know, what can I say? Uh, I, I wouldn't do it. I, I think damaging your gut microbiome is, is probably not something that, that you want to do. So, um, that's any other questions. Uh, you can make your own, you know, I recommend, um, we're getting late on the, on the hour, but I recommend that you, ex you can experiment with different sweeteners. I mean, there's just, just be cautious of this issue with resetting your, your sort of thermostat when it comes to se sweet sensitivity. So that's it. I think we covered everything. Uh, thank you so much. I see we have a bunch of other people who came into uh, the class tonight. Um, let me pull up the names. Uh, some other people that came in. Uh, looks like Helen came in and um, Paulette came in. Welcome, guys. Uh, George came in. Welcome, everybody. So thank you again. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, uh, looks like we have another message here. Uh, and I wish everyone a good night from uh, Miami Beach, as you can see in the in the, my background screen. And I uh, hope everyone's staying well and uh, keeping your sugar low so that your immune system is, is raring to go. And um, I wish everyone health and look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, we'll be talking about 10 unconventional weight loss tips. And I can tell you a lot of them have to do with, with your metabolism. And one of them, of course, being understanding your, your insulin level. And we'll get into a little more detail about that because under getting that insulin level is, is really low. Uh, Pat's asking about monk fruit. I think it's fine. You can give it a try for sure. Monk fruit combined with erythritol, it works, works very well as a, as a sweetener and is totally, totally safe. All right. Again, wish everyone well. Thank you again for your attention. And I look forward to seeing you uh, next Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Have a great night.